<laughs> is my watch wrong? Oh yeah, my watch is wrong. Y'all are going to watch me fit. No, I'm kidding. Um, okay, I'm gonna slow roll it for a second because uh, Bradley kindly offered to get me a coffee since there was no coffee out there. Um, but I will do this so you can hear me. It's working really well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Hmm. I don't want to say that. <laughs> okay, we can get going. Um, I did a talk at the last Evergreen Conference, uh, the one online last year, where I talked about uh, a project, kind of an experimental project I was doing to uh, remove eJeopardy uh, and replace it with a different messaging system. All good. Um, and uh, the so the, at that point, it was sort of a proof of concept, introducing a, introducing an idea, doing some demoing, talking about how some of the pieces fit together that I imagine them. And um, there was a lot of uh, positive feedback and uh, a lot of constructive feedback. So I wanted to revisit this time, talk about what we have talked about before in the, in the interim, talk about some changes I've made, and then talk about what we can do to uh, move forward with the project. If anyone wants my slides, they're not impressive slides, uh, but they're here on my GitHub site. I have a presentations uh, repository, so all the stuff's under there. And I also have the slides for the last talk, which goes into a little more detail about uh, some of the mechanics of um, sending messages around and how I anticipated the uh, messaging system working without eJeopardy. And one of the themes uh, last time was the, a lot of frustration around eJeopardy as a, uh, specifically as an application. So um, we're talking about two things. We're talking about eJeopardy, which is an application which runs a protocol, XMPP, which is the messaging protocol. The protocol itself is, it gets the job done. There's no real complaints there. eJeopardy is, can be finicky and can be a bit of a bear to, to work with. And since we're talking about it, I wanted to mention something that has come up a lot recently. There's, um, if you upgrade to opener Ubuntu 22.04, um, when you, especially if you're running in a virtualized environment or possibly only a virtualized environment, there are issues getting it to run, various issues. And one of the big ones has to do with the system D control. Uh, there's a service file and it tries to lock eJeopardy down, make it more secure. And uh, it interacts poorly with uh, virtualized Ubuntu 22. So if you're installing modern open surf on modern Ubuntu, um, just be aware of this. And this, this particular document here is on my Ansible installer script page, uh, but we should probably also put something on the, um, not the community site somewhere so that it's not uh, just here. Uh, but I wanted to mention it since we're on the topic. The proposed application that I wanted to use to replace eJeopardy, I didn't, I didn't go into the process with this idea. It sort of kind of was a lot of different things that fell together in various ways. And where I ended up with is a, a software uh, project called Redis, R-E-D-I-S. It started, it started out as a in-memory database, kind of like Memcache. It has a lot more functionality than Memcache. Uh, and it's also uh, advertises itself as a message broker and a streaming engine. So that's kind of more on the area that we're talking about. We can also consider using it as a data store, potentially as a replacement for Memcache down the road if we want to do that. Um, and as I mentioned last time, one of the reasons I ended up here is that I always love to look at the uh, let's see, the little window here is in my way. I always love the Stack Overflow developer survey. And uh, Redis is almost always the top of the preferred databases. So it, it started out really, it's just like, oh, why do people like it so much? And then kind of snowballed a little bit from there. But I love that Postgres is at the top because Postgres is awesome. And then we got Redis right there. <clears throat> but there's a, a ton of great documentation on the Redis site if you're interested in learning more. Um, 
the uh, it really doesn't do a whole lot, which is one thing I like about it. It's it's fairly concise and fairly well contained. The commands page is a really good resource for understanding how to interact with it. And there is a command line interface. So all these commands you can just type in and inspect and modify data in all kinds of really interesting ways. So instead of doing a full recap of the previous session, um, I wanted to do what I thought was kind of a highlight slide. Uh, and it's taking a second for the network to load the slide. So sometimes I have to refresh this guy. There it goes. So I've put a I created a timer script, run it on identical VMs, one running my Redis branch, one running classical OpenSurf, and um, just to get a sense of the timing variations. And this this completely surprised me, and why I ended up going down this route uh, with with great gusto. The uh, the Redis message delivery is uh, just so much faster. Uh, small messages, large messages. Um, messages with extra hops along the way, things like that. Uh, if you watch this for a second, uh, you'll get through about four or five or six Redis runs of the script before one eJabberty version will get through the script. It's really, I was really shocked by this. At the end of the session last time, uh, we had an open discussion in the, um, you know, just on the online thing. And uh, we uh, especially talked a lot with Mike there's Mike um, and uh, and Galen and other people that were involved with the discussion there. And so we come up, we we talked about a number of things that we wanted to make sure weren't lost in the translation. When I created the proof of concept, I did not add support for the open surf router. If you went to Jason Boyer's session this morning, you may remember that the router can play an incredibly critical role in um, systems that are not just a single one server setup. So if you need to communicate across multiple bricks or you want to have that interleaving of the uh, sort of the multi-tenant setup where you have services on different machines talking across machines, then you have to have a router. So that was kind of the first big thing that uh, that came up in a discussion after the last session. Uh, some other things that came up, there was a proposal uh, to look at an alternate uh, functionality on the Redis side. I approached it using uh, lists, essentially, queues more or less, just add things to lists, pop things off lists. That's how the messages go from one place to the next. But they also have functionality called streams. And that, um, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more, uh, but I'll get that to the second. And then the last one is just minimal uh, migration requirements. We don't wanna have to make moving to this variation of OpenSurf uh, to be complicated or something that requires a lot of handholding. So I'm gonna kind of touch on each three of these in the main body of what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> multi-domain routing. So um, the benefits of the open source router and multi-domain routing in particular, high availability is a big one. Um, and again, that goes back to uh, Jason's talk earlier today where you have clusters intercommunicating. So you have a service that fails on one machine, all the other services can just route around it via the router, find a service on a different machine and get their question answered that way. So that's a big obvious bonus. Additional security, the router is, the router enforces um, domain segmentation on the system. So some services that talk directly to the database, generally we don't want them to have public access. So you don't want to have CStore to be accessible from the internet because you could send request, send commands to CStore that modify data directly without permissions checking or anything like that. So uh, the router enforces that separation. If you come to the website, come to the gateway, come to Apache, whatever, and you try to send a request to a private service like CStore, it's talking to the public router. It can't, there's no CStore on the public router. So it says, sorry, you can't talk to this. So that's just one additional layer of security. There's some other security considerations baked into with them. Um, uh, Redis authentication and permissions and stuff. And then another benefit of getting the router back is uh, that it's it makes OpenSurf once again backwards compatible with some of the older interfaces that we're slowly getting rid of, but we still have. Uh, Dojo in particular uses something called the translator, the uh, and it requires a router to work because it uh, it does it supports long-term conversations across multiple bricks, which requires you to be able to get to one router and then hop over to another router. But anyway, they work with the router. 
So the round is kind of necessary there. On the topic of high availability, uh, just wanted to give a visual of kind of how this might work in practice. The um, client is talking to sort of an evergreen cluster on a single VM. You can imagine the domain one being a VM, domain two being another VM. Client sends a request, it bounces off the Redis instant, goes to the router. The router knows that the, let's say, C store service on this domain is not working because C store either didn't register or it deregistered or it crashed or something like that. And it, it it's able to determine that that service is not available on this domain. But over here, we have C store running and it did register with this router. So then it can just pop over to the for the message to the Redis instance on the other domain. And then that will make it to the listener. And then the rest is pretty straightforward standard stuff. Part of supporting routing in Redis uh, is that we need to have a way to specify domains. Where does a client live? In the Jabber world, that's managed by the fact that a client logs into a domain on the Jabber server. You log into public.localhost, you log into app1.localnet or whatever you have. That's not the same, or it doesn't have to be the same in Redis. You, you can have... Redis instance is running on multiple domains, of course, but the domain is not part of how it communicates with the outside world. As far as it's concerned, you connect to it, you can talk to it, that's it. So we need some way for the individual running open source services and clients to know, and the router especially, to know what domain you're sitting on and what domain you want to talk to. So this information is uh, encoded in the address of the, int of the entity that connects to the Redis instance. Um, and props to Mike for proposing this as a way to uh, handle the, the routing. Um, the, uh, so just a couple of examples here. The, um, the OpenSurf prefix is just, it could be anything, doesn't have to be there at all. It's just, it helps a little bit with setting permissions and access on different uh, parts of the system. And then there is a purpose. So the address will say, uh, this is a service address, like C-Store, this is a router address, this is a specific client address. Uh, and then the bottom example is this is a client that is working for a C store, a C store worker. And that's more just for debugability. But the first three parts here, the prefix, the purpose, and the um, domain slash service name are required. And the rest just provides debug information and some uh, randomness. So you're not uh, clobbering addresses. Whoops. So um, since we last spoke, we have a router now. The router can speak Redis. The router supports the standard router stuff that we're used to on the Evergreen side. And then here's where I kind of throw a wrench in things. Um, you know, no, nothing's ever a straight path, right? I, I got, I went down this, uh, this rabbit hole sort of, uh, I was teaching myself Rust, the programming language, and I wanted to write something that wasn't just hello world with a thousand threads. Um, because you run out of stuff to do. And it, it, it helps me to have a purpose. Um, so that's kind of where this started. And um, the uh, so that's what got me into the Redis side is because the XMPP support was minimal, very, very minimal. I don't know if it's any much better now. I haven't looked recently. Um, and I wasn't really interested in trying to code a, a sort of XMPP layer uh, on the Rust side. So I thought about trying some other stuff to see what happened. That led to Redis. So um, invariably and unsurprisingly, some of the stuff I have done is in Rust. Uh, and that's going to be part of the talk today is how we want to manage that or if we want to manage that or what we want to do. So the, um, the, the, the one piece in particular that right now is written in Rust that would be required to run this is the router itself. So that doesn't mean it has to be. We can make the same changes to the existing OpenSurf router. It just so happens that I did it in Rust first. So I'm not trying to shove this down everyone's throat here. I'm just pointing out that's how we got here. We can figure this out. Um, the
Um, so uh, some of the stuff uh, that I did have over on this repo that I'll mention briefly, the router, obviously that's the only kind of key thing that is, uh, I implemented a WebSockets translator. So that would be a way to get rid of the WebSocket D dependency. And then to kind of sweeten the pot a little bit, I added some um, uh, request throttling. So there's the client in a certain way, it'll send tons and tons and hundreds of requests to a single service in the back end. And you may uh, use up all of the PCRUD backends for some um, per service request throttling to this implementation of the WebSocket. Um, so that that would, you know, I don't know, solve the problem. I added a um, parallel WebSocket tester on the sandbox page. If you're not familiar with the sandbox page and the staff client, if you go slash staff slash sandbox, it is this chaotic mess <laughs> of some kind of new thing and you don't know what to do with it. So you just put it in here and kind of use it as a demo tool. So there's a bunch of stuff in here. And so I just threw a thing at the top where you hit a button, it instantly launches 500 requests and it uses the throttling on the website back end to manage that. So if you hit the button, then it's, it completes the 500 requests. Whereas if you did that now, you get up to about 80, say, and then it would stop because you would max out. Um, so uh, that is just a little icing on top of uh, a potential move to a Rust website. Because again, just trying to learn as much as I could about it. There's a JSON gateway that'll let you send, receive hashed formats in addition to the classical format. Uh, there's open source servers, um, all fun stuff. And just one of the things I added to the router that was being built is that I, I wanted to make more, uh, I wanted to make it more visible what was happening within the router. So I'm fleshing out more content as far as the services that are working on that. But this is an example of a summarized command I added. Um, okay, yeah. So that's that's the detour. Well, I'll continue touching on that a little bit as we go. Number two, message streams. Um, so message streams have an example they often give uh, in the oh, documentation is things like telemetry data. Uh, so for example, you have a device that's measuring temperature outside and it's just constantly sending off this constant flow of stuff. It's timestamped, all the messages have IDs, and then one or more clients can listen to that information and process it in all kinds of different ways. You could just take it as a time, you get old messages, you can have multiple people receiving the same messages, you can have uh, people receiving the messages and someone else analyzing who's receiving the messages. So it's it really offers a lot. Um, and the other one uh, is the ability to acknowledge processing. So if we wanted to bake it into Evergreen where you didn't tell Redis that you had completed the task until you had completed the task. <clears throat> and the uh, streams tutorial is really great if you want to read that. So I, um, well, I, I'm skipping ahead for myself. The, uh, the Redis has a command line program very useful for debugging. You can see all the data. You can analyze all this kind of great stuff. Regardless of what you're using, there's a ton of ways to access and manipulate the data. So I just wanted to give an example of, so you do a write push, which is basically just a push on an array, do it again, do it again, and then you do a blocking pop, which says if there's nothing in the list, wait up to 60 seconds, and then um, if I don't get anything, I'll move on. Yeah, streams um, naturally are a little bit more interesting because they do so much more stuff. So this is the same task using a Redis stream versus the list push and pop. So some of the stuff you have to, to code in the conversation, eventually my server is gonna fall over. So that's why I put the max length in there. And um, you have to tell a little bit more about if you are a group, if you're subscribing to a stream, what the stream is called, should it make the stream? Um, and then the responses you get back in, what stream the responses came from, things like that. So it just gives you a little bit of a sense of the way the two different approaches look. So I, after the conversation last time, I coded a version that uses streams instead of lit, have any real complaints with it. Um, it, uh, it has potential that I have not yet realized, but that could be something there to offer. Um, but I also found that when I was doing debugging and testing, it was a lot more cumbersome in this kind of environment, um, as opposed to this kind of environment. Um, especially if you're kind of in a hurry, this is just easier to pop through. So essentially what I did for the time being is at the time, it may offer benefit in the future. There is a commit here that we can apply that will add the strings right back. It just modifies the bits of code and the C and the Perl that taught you that out and then you're using strings. So it's that's that's something that is kind of open for debate, discussion, however we want to use that. I'm perfectly fine either way, honestly. Um, and then finally, the third of the big requirements here is minimal upgrade. Um, I was doing stuff like creating a lot, like a YAML version of the open source core and, and you know just stuff like that. And of course you realize at some point that that's just adding complication that's unnecessary. Um, so, you know, some of it is sort of flights of fancy that you kind of have to come back to earth. Um, so that the existing open source core, the existing open source.xml, no need to change there. The, uh, there is a new config file, and this is, I'll show you the contents of this. It, it's a, um, 
a file that lists the Redis accounts. Oh, I didn't mean to actually leave the page there. And so similarly to how we register Jabber users now, when you go through the open surf setup, suitable files, kind of like SQL files, and you can define among other things, just run any kind of generic command. You can run these files here. And so here's an example of where we're creating the open surf user. We're setting um, the permissions looks a little funny, but that's just how Redis specifies them. And it's all, it's all well documented. Uh, as far as permissions go, um, as an example, the if you log in or the gateway login can't send a, a message to send messages to the router. And then the router figures out where everything goes, but we don't want to be able to talk directly to a service just as an added level of um, indirect a different domain, but still it's, you know, uh, belt and suspenders. So the idea is uh, what I want to do with this file is I want to add a build time process that replaces no one will ever have to type this value. It will be living in this file. We'll tell Redis about it. It will be living in OpenSurf core where those passwords are defined. Uh, and then uh, in theory, no one will ever have to think about it or look at it. This file will just, it. but this is pretty easy and pretty understandable. And then I already mentioned generating random passwords at build time. We're at a point now where it is installable and people can try it out and run it. I have uh, links to an open source branch in the working repository. I have links to it quick oh, down here. So that's the open source branch and there's a lot more going on there. And then on the evergreen side, there's one commit to add uh, the library for the Redis C bindings. Just a commit that's unrelated that I need to look at the launch pad for to see what was going on, but it's not related to any of this. It was just getting in my way. Uh, and then a small change to opensurf.core, not the form, um, whereas before it was an open surf account, I'm using a separate gateway account for the public gateway login. So those working branches are there. I have a demo site set up that anyone, if anyone wants to poke around, that is redis.demo.kcls.eg.org. It's a minimal thing. It's not going to be particularly fast or anything. The point, of course, is that you don't know the difference. Um, at, at best, it's a little faster, but uh, I wouldn't expect to poke around and make sure that uh, it's doing what you think it ought to be doing. And then finally, my uh, Ansible installer, I've added a branch to, well, if I just go back to the main page real quick. Uh, at the top, I have an experimental version here, 20, Ubuntu 22 uh, with the Redis code and um, everything for you installs everything. As it stands right now, it installs the Rust router and the WebSockets bit. Um, to uh, So, you know, we can kick the tires on those if we want to, but uh, this shouldn't see how it feels. Let's do some comparisons, that kind of thing. Some stuff I want to plan, uh, apart from using the British style in future in hospital. Um, uh, there's a direct to drone request delivery. This will be easier now that we're kind of down in here and, and working on this. Um, one of the with part of the reason it's good to have sort of more of a mesh of pieces communicating is that um, it's not totally uncommon uh, for uh, now for a particularly large request to cause an issue with a open source that machine or that that service as a whole on that machine can no longer function. And that's when you're routing requests off to other machines. Um, one of, or possibly the only, I don't know, uh, but it, the main reason this happens, and then it in turn takes that data and passes it down through a, pro, to a, through a pipe, of inner process pipe to a worker process. And then the worker process does the action here would be to have the workers themselves pull the requests off the bus and, and leave the listener out of that completely. And then the listener's job is just to manage the worker processes. In other words. Um, and with that, the idea is that at worst, a single worker would die, and then you still have, you know, 79 other workers ready to pick up, uh, pick up the job. I'm not included in this discussion for now because it's another big change. It's something that should be tested separately. And as I mentioned before, Redis is a database, so we could potentially use it as optional disk persistence. So we could write auth tokens to Redis, and then your Redis server crashes boot it back up, all of your auth tokens are still there. You don't lose it all like you do now with memcache of memcache. That we had, because we had talked before about doing it in database, this is cheaper. Um, so that's a possibility. To do items, I don't have a launchpad ticket up for this yet. I need to do that. Um, some decision regarding the Rust bits. Do we use them? Do we save it for later? Do we save it for future discussion? Is it too much change at once? Um, or is it, you know, willing to give the passwords and install time so we don't have to do that. And so everyone's passwords aren't just password. If, if we use the Rust stuff, it would need to be moved some of it off of the KCLS side and into a community repository. It's all documentation, uh, but I'm sure there's a, a few more bits and pieces that I need to address there. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty well on its way. And is that where it stops? That's where it stops. Open for questions and encouragement. Yes. Um. 
regarding the speed of Redis, I'm just curious, is there any overhead processing trade-off on that? At the last session I did, I pulled up top okay. and showed that demo running with top running and Redis uses less resources okay. than Jabber. My, my, where I was going with that, if it increased, I was wondering if it has more requests, potentially, potentially overloaded processing on right. that trade-off. And if, but if it's less, then that's fantastic. Yep, the trade off for the speed with Redis being faster. And um, uh, so far, every experiment I've done has shown Redis to be significantly lower resource usage, CPU is lower. Um, and I'm pretty darn. Really, what it comes down to is it just does less, way less. Uh, XMPP just has a lot of potential logic built into it. And there's all these plugins, all these pieces, and everything. Uh, this, there's no thought involved whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, on, uh, regarding your well, which I Uh huh. <laughs> it could be very personal side that you entertain uh, the notion of having rust uh, above the um, experience with kind of the environmental uh, aspects. Um, so let's consider what a soccer team go program. Mm -hmm. We don't have to know what we have to do. Uh, it's uh, kind of the easiest of dependency to deal with. Uh, um, and then, of course, on the other extreme, uh, the joy that is the anger and the various ambient. Dependencies, mm -hmm. um, Rust to fit uh, in terms of getting this uh, dependencies, staying up to date with compiler and library versions, and so on and so forth. And so, yep. Since he's facing that way, it's a little hard to hear. So oh, yeah. Hard. Yes. Uh, so the question had to do with um, sort of how would Rust sit in the, you know, it's kind of yelling at you about warnings and these things don't match this thing. And, you know, people, developers are putting stuff in the messages that you're know, scary and but, uh, you know, uh, NPM is pretty wild west uh, versus something like uh, WebSocket D that we're currently using where we don't care. We just download it. So uh, uh, Rust is in the middle of that. There, um, it uses a, a packaging system, a build system called Cargo. Cargo, if you need it, if you require some dependency management for you, if you have a billion dependencies, you're going to run into problems um, as with anything. So that that does exist. Um, the after you install the dependencies and do the build, you do end up with a standalone binary that could, you could plop it on any Linux system, it'll go. So there's some benefit to that, but there are, so we pull in dependencies for Redis, obviously, and some of the stuff I'm doing with Post. Yeah, there are dependencies and I'm sure at some point we're gonna we're gonna hit cargo install and there's gonna be a problem. Um, so that is very much something to consider. Yeah. yeah. And as far as the um, safety say disputes, whatever Debian very much you have package, or do we also need to stay up to date with uh, respect to the latest grade? To package Rust is what I've been using. Um, there is, when you go to the site, they recommend you do a version where it just installs in your home, di home directory and it's kind of latest and greatest. Anything outside of that. So it's just using the app install. Yep. Can we re implement the Rust open service in Rust? Later. <laughs> well, I've I've already coded a server side. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I yeah, yeah, I don't know if that's a question I should answer. <laughs> um yeah, that's a big question. Okay. Well and a slightly more concrete you know way. Um at this point, is there any benefit of us to at least open the door to considering things like rewriting some of the leaves. Part of my thinking was that when you consider all the coders in here and all the coders in Evergreen, there's a few total of anyone who's actually edited the C code. Um, now, more people know C, so there, there is. So I see that as a possible target for replacement. Um, I'm not in any rush to do it personally, but I mean, it certainly could be, uh, I think it's sensible as, as something to consider. Yeah. C-like program. Um, the, the key well, was a couple of key benefits, but a lot of it has to do with, you have to be more conscious and uh, about how you manage your variables and memory. And then it, you don't get memory leaks, basically. You, you can get logical memory leaks, like an array that goes on and on and on, but um, you can't leak a specific variable. It just, the compiler will not let you. It will complain at you until you fix the problem. Having it manage all the memory stuff is a huge benefit and it compiles down just like C to machine code and it's super fast and all that good stuff, which is why I'm personally very excited about it. and developer survey as a, as a beloved language. It's hard to learn. It's hard to learn, um, which is why I ended up writing much code. Uh, but now that I'm accustomed to it, I feel that it's an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, it's very fast and they, it's like you make it happy. Um, there's such a great chance that you hit run and it actually just does what you coded it to do, which is very different from a, an interpreted language where you're doing much more on the back end. Absolutely, it could be a replacement for C. Um, 
there's I'm sure there's some security benefits to you know double freeing and um, buffer overflows and stuff like that. It's just all eradicated. It's it'll panic. It'll do whatever it has to do to make you stop. It won't let you access the memory you don't have control access to. I've got less of a question, more of a, a comment back on the Redis part. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> so, and this goes back to what you and I were talking about after the, your last session. I think the is awesome as a stopgap before having going directly to the um, to uh, drones going directly to hungry, mm hungry, -hmm. hippo, the, the messages. Because I think that's the oh, more complicated. It's trying to figure out how to make sure that nobody else gets nobody gets in the way of anybody else. And all, all, everybody only gets one message. And to say that I think it's I think it's awesome that we that, that now we have like a stepping stone to get off of XMPP XMPP mm -hmm. onto something faster and stuff. Like literally, we can just point yeah. to our memcache things directly at Redis. Yep, and it'll just work. Yep, it's just key values. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, right. uh, you know, multiple Redis servers and all that kind of thing. Yes. So I just wanted to say thanks for sticking with it. I know. And, and I was like, no, we can't. <laughs> this is awesome. So thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the way it's going to. And I, I obviously appreciate the input big time. The hippo style. It was not my expectation to get rid of the router. Like now the router, as far as I'm concerned, is there to stay. Well, I think um, that there's an opportunity to go entirely okay. on to do with lists alone. That, that's, but, but gotcha. And gotcha. That, the benefit there would be one less round trip through some. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that would be more of a stream thing than a list thing. Yeah. The um the if in, in the context of using lists and going delivered to an address, a service address, then the hippo is just grab and Redis makes sure only one person gets it. Um in the stream scenario, some other mechanism have to be in place to make sure multiple people don't get the same message. Only one person can get each value. Yeah. Okay. I like the technical term hungry hungry hippo style. There's no better description. Yeah. <laughs> Tabletop round, just dump the messages out on the table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Is there any on the wire uh, security differences between today, XMPD, and Redis? Um, for the security for Jabber, Redis, um, I would say they're probably about the same. Right now, we're using plain auth on the Jabber side, which is uh, a, a free, uh, like plain text passwords, I think, essentially. Um, and as it's set up right now with the branches I have in place, it's the same with Redis. Uh, I don't know how it sends the passwords, honestly. I'm not sure how it does that, but um, it is, pass they're both password authenticated. They're both unencrypted at this point because generally it's behind firewall. Um, so I would say they're pretty close. But if I understood, and maybe I did, the difference is rather you can skip all the ETAB or registration and just that was your direct file password. So it counts with the cert. Well you, well, you do, but it's just, you do it differently. Right. Yeah. But that's where you get the password complexity. That you right. Probably have to see what's status. Yes, you could throw giant UUID. Even in some of our productions, <laughs> Jabber, password creator. I'm which which environments are those? Exactly. <laughs> in, in terms of the list versus streams, and you had kind of pros and cons, and said, yeah, lists were much simpler, and therefore. Yeah, and and I get overwhelmed easily, honestly. Like I like things that are just sort of, yeah. But you know, suddenly it's right. more important. Um, you mentioned how lists have the ability to do the, mm -hmm. give me something. If there's nothing, hold on until there is something or until the timeout value and make sure you're only giving me the thing that you're not giving anyone. When you have the scenario of message gets picked up by a drone or the sparrow, mm -hmm. in the case could be at this point in time, and that get lost or that kind of thing. I don't think list has anything in the realm of this is pending, but it hasn't been confirmed no. by the thing that claimed it. No. I think streams has that five step of the acknowledging. Yeah. Um, do we, this started as a question of earlier in my mind as what were some of the things that we were looking at streams for to start and have they just been addressed other means like was streams a way of doing a couple of things without needing to have a router and by uh, partially I, I think from my perspective there's a lot of possibility there there's a lot of potential there. yeah on the stream side because they're really specific thing in mind that was streams um it wasn't the, the lists were able to accomplish the baseline Right. 
does does what work? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Down into the Redis mm -hmm. protocol level uh, that you don't have to deal with at the at, at, you don't have a separate router that that's complex the innately at this point right so it's that's the that's that's free to us as opposed to the new complexity that would be replaced more of a which level do you want it to be complex at and <laughs> when Bill's sitting down on his own doing some development to get stuff working with right. Redis not using streams is the exactly. And they're both, uh, I saw no speed difference between streams and lists. It's it's all just gravy. I just want to add, when you're showing the examples with the lists up there, I'm like, oh, that's a stack. My brain can deal with that. <laughs> right. I push something, push something, push something, pop something, pop something, pop going on. It's a radio. Right. That, again, where, where does the complexity lie? In the scenario where you have, you don't put a router in, mm -hmm. and you have a hungry post situation, and whether it's streams or lists, is the way of doing that uh, Jason was discussing earlier this morning, essentially a function of anything that would normally throw a message into Redis just knows how to communicate with them over the network. I haven't actually thought this part through. Oh, okay. okay. The non-router string approach sure. um, is sort of next yeah. level of exploration. Okay. Um, yeah. Have you looked at the Redis licensing catalog? I have. Evergreen. I'm sure it, it's probably a good question for you have got far away the amounts providing us as a service. It's okay to take this in Evergreen. Where to go? We were just talking about this yesterday. I thought it was on the homepage here. Um, <laughs> yeah. It is. That's 2019. They started talking about uh, providing it as a next service. It was very generic. There next is a dual license. Um, it's on Redis.io. I think it's also uh, Redis.com slash legal slash license. Yeah. Then the is the three blocks. That's what I remember reading. What was it? Redis.com slash. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So we have the three clause BSD um, for the, I guess, the base package. A new version of fancy features. Right. Uh, and it's, we're not, a, a vendor like Equinox would be providing a Redis as a service platform for you to just do whatever you want. It would just be a component of the weather. It makes sense to me. Like, yeah, it, I, I think it would just be if there was licenses required for the uh, <coughs> client -like server itself. Um, so the, it is on GitHub, just the, the source code, if anyone's curious. Some, so. some of the Redis licensing changes, and I think the last time they tweaked with it, rounds the whole company's providing X as a service to the general public without right. basically cutting into Redis Labs hosted, well, I mean, kind of pretty not. Um, a lot of what they had done in terms of changing licenses was related to the Redis core itself. Okay. So, yeah. Like, uh, I think in 2019, they realized those from me. Um, so do you know if you're utilizing any Redis modules? I did apt install. So I, yeah, whatever, possibly not. possibly not. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if it needs a special module to, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that was kind of my thinking as well. Right. Right. Yeah, 